Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm really excited to be here today with Dr. Mazen Nouradine, who's the ex-founding director of the Fatty Liver Program at Cedar sinai and currently a professor of medicine at Houston Methodist Hospital. He's also the director of the Houston Research Institute. Dr. Nouradine, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. It's a privilege to be here today, and thank you for inviting me. So you have done a ton of work in uh, the intersection of liver disease and precision medicine, and uh, you've been working on this field for the majority of your career. I understand that it actually goes back to you know some personal connection to this field where your grandmother developed cryptogenic cirrhosis, which we would call today, I guess, MASH cirrhosis or, or last year, NASH cirrhosis. For people who don't work in this field every day, what do people not understand about liver disease more generally and what drew you to dedicate so much of your professional career? Uh, to doing this important work. Yeah, thank you for going back to that. And I guess the story started in before I was born in the 70s, when my grandmother developed cryptogenic cirrhosis. And my father actually is a gastroenterologist who was doing his fellowship training in England. And he got a phone call one day that my grandma has ascites and that she's terminal. And then through some recommendation over the phone, she was in Syria and he was in England. And uh, through his recommendations, he managed her for a year or two and then she passed away. But yeah, I, I grew up in, in a medical family. My father taught me in medical school. In medical school, huh. you had to have a thesis. And uh, my thesis was actually on the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in type 2 diabetics. and um, he was my professor and I, I did the thesis and I actually did not, I knew that I want to do GI, I knew I want to do liver, but then I also kind of w- went back and forth during residency if I should do just GI or liver, but then I went to a liver heavy place at uh, USC University of Southern California and had a couple of mentors that they were inspiration to me, Neil Kaploids and Shelly Liu. And then the rest of their history, I went to the NIH and and then fellowship and after the other and have been working on multiple aspects of liver disease. What did we know about NAFLD at the time that you wrote your PhD thesis? And what are the two or three biggest things that have changed since then? And, and not everybody listening to the podcast will necessarily know about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which has also been recently renamed. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the broad category and then some of the the big changes in the field. I know I'm asking you to do a, what could be a whole textbook in, in one answer, but actually, feel free to break it down. No, actually, the, the other way around, it's like much easier because I, I, wrote that, I wrote that thesis in 2001. We are in 2023. So that's 22 years later. I can tell you if that thesis, I, if I would publish it today, it would not get published because it would not be no, novel anymore. But back then, I think it was like the prevalence just like a simple, like the first two sentence, t- uh, two sentences of any introduction paper today, the prevalence of NAFLD and type 2 diabetes and advanced fibrosis. And we know it's like almost 60 to 70%. And the advanced fibrosis is about up to 70 to 20%. And the, the, the in, in simple words, it has increased in, in terms of uh, in terms of the prevalence of NAFLD and type 2 diabetes. And as you know, like we're talking about precision medicine here, the biomarkers have improved significantly. Treatment and management has been uphill. And we can talk about fatty liver, mazold, and MASH clinical trials difficulties. That's a very specialized topic. But we know that we kind of like overcoming that hump and we have a potential drug approval this year. And in addition, they have been advancement in precision medicine, such as genes and SNP that have been discovered in specific ethnic groups that increase them for NAVLD as well as MASH, such as Hispanic. So indeed, like, you know, and as you know, Patrick, we are just around the corner from a special topic conference in Las Vegas next month that I'm co-chairing. I'll by see you the there. American, 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 you, you coming? Yes, I'll be there. Oh, that's great. So we will attend all the lectures and party after. So, yes. <laughs> so we will, it's designed for precision medicine and it's done by the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease. So a lot of excitement in the field and there are drugs, non-invasive testing are progressing and the genetics, although we're still at the very beginning, but we have a good deal and we need more. 
Yeah. So maybe you can talk about this hopeful, I mean, I, I, I'm hoping it's all but a done deal, but this approval of the first treatment, which is not to be underestimated in how much it's going to hopefully change the field. So it's the compound is called resmetaram, And maybe you can talk a little bit about how it works, who it's for. You've run more than 40 clinical trials. We're going to, I think, get into what you've learned from uh, being part of that many studies. But what's what's special about this compound? And more importantly, what does it mean for the field once it hopefully gets approved? in the next uh, couple of weeks. Yeah. And I, I invite everyone to read the paper. It just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine this week. It's a drug that is oral medication. It targets what's called thyroid hormone beta receptors in the liver. So when I was in actually medical school, that's a long time ago, I did not know much about the thyroid hormone receptors in the liver. There are different type of thyroid hormone receptors, but the beta are specific to the liver, where they regulate glucose and lipid metabolism, mitochondrial metabolism, and fatty acid oxidation. And long story short, the drug has been tried over multiple clinical trials and end, ended up with this product and the phase three study that, as I mentioned, published in the New England Journal, where the we enrolled patients into Resmetarom 180 milligram compared to the plus 100 milligram, 80 milligram compared to the placebo. And right now, the primary endpoint of MASH studies uh, that patients need histology, liver biopsy. They compare if they, they're what's called steatohepatitis, which is the inflammation plus the fat in the liver and fibrosis to be improved as a proof of concept. And this is what the FDA required as well as the AMA. So in that study, the, the drug hit both endpoints in terms of steatohepatitis improvement, which we call it NASH resolution, and fibrosis improvement. It also has possible or it has effects on dyslipidemia in a favorable way. So we hope that this will open the door for treatments for patients and continue to build on it for additional treatments. Why we need an additional treatment? We believe this field is like type 2 diabetes. We started with metformin and then or other medications and then metformin and uh, there was insulin and other medications now are still coming. So the mazled or MASH field is similar. It's a metabolic disease. It gets uh, It goes in hand in hand with other metabolic features such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, but you need specific drugs for them that at the same time could affect that could affect other organs in a holistic way. So this is just the beginning and I think it's a great year for our patients. What what have you learned from being involved in more than 40 different clinical trials? You you have a shot with each one of these to, you know, test a potentially amazing new therapeutic agent, but you also have many years and many millions of dollars that often get spent before you get to learn if that design was right, if the compound works, sometimes the compound works, but the di design isn't right. What are the things that people often get wrong or that you really need to think very carefully about at the beginning of a program to make sure you don't end up with these high profile failures that often cause whole companies to leave a therapy area, right? If it doesn't work out because they haven't got the right compound or, or yeah. approach. Oh man, you asked me to summarize the last decade of my career, <laughs> but let me start with patient's awareness. When over the years, I've had many, many patients coming to me where they were told that they're fine. They just have fatty liver. Just go lose weight. Yeah. You're done. And then the doctors, including primary care, endocrinologists, and even gastroenterologists, they forgot to check on them. Many will show up in my office and they have a diagnosis of cirrhosis and it's complication. like such as ascites, variceal bleed, that are the footstep of liver transplantation. So that was sad. That was hard to watch. And luckily, in the last few years, we increased awareness, and the new guidelines now recommend screening the high-risk patients. In addition, patients felt nothing. They're mostly asymptomatic, although if you dig deep, there are symptoms. And many of them, they were afraid of doing anything, especially when you tell them we don't have treatments and liver biopsy is the next step and we offer you clinical trials. But walking them through that, they, they learn that this is beneficial for them. 
of course, clinical trial design have been evolving over time. We started with biopsy only, and then we moved to phase two A's throughout the years with non-invasive tests such as MR, uh, MR fat fraction, MR elastography. There are other biomarkers evolving. So it, it was great to watch and be part of that development uh, over the years. And I think many trials failed for multiple reasons, including not getting the duration correctly or difficulties with liver biopsy and its biases or targeting a population like they're too sick and the drug might not work. So we have learned a great deal until we got to at, at least to the first, hopefully, drug approval this year. So it has been painful but rewarding at the same time, especially when you have a drug about to be approved this year. And when the drug hopefully gets approved, there's going to be an even bigger focus on early detection. And maybe we can talk about the potential alternatives to biopsy because uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think biopsy is a is a method that's going to scale for an entire population. And, and we're talking about tens of millions of people with, you know, with fatty liver disease and advancing towards end stage outcomes like liver transplant that we want to avoid. So maybe you can talk about the diagnosis challenge and, and some of the tools that we have at our disposal to do early non-invasive diagnosis, which I think you spent a lot of your career as well working on. Yeah, Patrick, so let me, let's start with the numbers, right? So the most recent data is, is saying that up to 30% of the population and in, in, in some states, there are data from like from my state of Texas, it's up to 40% of people, they have what's called MASL, which is the disease umbrella. Now, fortunately, not everyone will progress. The people who progress are those that progress to MASH, which is about 10 to 20% of MASL. Still a lot of people, right? Like let's say 30% of 300 million, and then 10 to 20%, you still have a lot of people with MASH. Our focus though, are those that they start getting fibrosis, scarring on top of the inflammation and fat. And those that when they get to stage two and higher, of scarring fibrosis. You know, you start at zero, you go all the way up to four cirrhosis. When you start at stage two and higher, those are the people that have proven to have more outcomes, more morbidities, mortalities, liver transplant, all these problems. And those are the patients we usually target in the phase three clinical trials in particular. So initially when they were learning about the disease, the disease started with biopsy and histology findings. It was in the eighties when someone said, well, I have these patients on the biopsy, a pathologist. I'm seeing fat of loss inflammation, and we know that happens in alcohol, and we blame them that they don't they, they drink alcohol, but they actually don't. They have more metabolic features such as type type 2 diabetes. And this is when the disease first name was coined as NAVOLD or NASH. And then over time, the disease has evolved over biopsy teaching and learning. And in the last decade or so, we learned that. We can detect things, especially fat in the liver, using non-invasive tests such as MRI or ultrasound techniques. And importantly, the fibrosis concept, if your liver is, has fibrosis, it gets stiff. So you get these new technologies that measure the stiffness of the liver, which reflect fibrosis. So right now in clinical practice, what we use, there are tools such as what we call transcendental histography or a mar fat fraction and a mar in addition to liver enzymes and new blood tests that can detect these patients. It is still required for clinical trials to do a liver biopsy, but at least we're not doing it in everyone in, in clinical practice. And I think one day we'll move away from the liver biopsy when we have enough evidence to the FDA telling them those measurements are enough and they can tell you if they improve the outcome of the patients improve, which is what they are asking us for. So it's exciting field. And I think it's, it's, it's just getting uh, better and better despite the initial concerns about liver biopsy is the bottleneck in, the, in this field. But I feel like we're, we're moving away from that. What does it take to move away from that, do you think? Are the technology wise, uh, are all the ingredients there? Is there, in, in your opinion, is the replacement technology or set of technologies already around? And it's uh, more of a matter of amassing the data and time to make the case that through a combination of blood tests and transient elastography and something else, we can do the same thing without having to go in with a needle and take a biopsy? Or, or is there a technology gap that you see? Yeah, 
I, I don't they, I think all of the above, but mostly like we need more data. If you act, you actually talk to many optimistic people, we say we ha- we have the data already showing that either tricellulostography or amarylostography or even some blood tests, they do correlate with outcomes. And what's outcomes? This is what happens when the patient gets worse. And in the liver language, he has ascites fluid in the abdomen, uh, which correlates with liver transplants. Hepatic encephalopathy confusion of in the patient with cirrhosis and variceal bleed, which is life-threatening, which is like the varices bleed in the esophagus and eventually liver transplant. So data on transcendental lithography and model lithography showed very good correlation or prediction of outcomes. Nevertheless, the regulators are asking for more large multi-center data and following improvement lead to improvement and worsening lead to worsening. So we're, we have multiple consortiums that either we started or were involved in that is addressing that message. As also you can imagine, like having ultrasounds and MRIs are limited to certain offices. So now we started seeing blood tests that predict these patients, meaning I want to find the patient who has this, what we call it, at risk mass, which is steatohepatitis plus the fibrosis, the scarring at stage two and higher. So now we have a newer blood test that can detect that, and they're just getting to the market right now. And eventually, we're going to have outcomes data with them. So it's we're we're making good progress. So we need more data, and then the easier test, the blood test, they still need to see to show the outcome data, and then we adopt them. We mentioned genetics at the top of the show, and for those who aren't intimately familiar with the genetics of the disease, I'll I'll ask you to do a little bit of a quick primer on it. But uh, going back to 2008, there was a gene called PMPLA3 that was discovered that remains the you know the, the primary focus from a drug target perspective and is one of the ones you reference at the top of the show as being a major risk factor that's different in different populations for example it's higher frequency in in the hispanic population but there have been many other genes discovered with different impacts on risk factors and you and and others have also published polygenic risk score work that looks at the you know the, the complex role that genetics has to play in in this group of diseases maybe you can talk a little bit about where we're at with that today, and then we can explore a little bit of how it's relevant today, but also what's likely to change in the future. Sure. So there have been some GWAS studies and some observations uh, looking at genetic risk factors in this population, and it's not super easy, Patrick, right? This is a disease that is multifactorial, and genes, sure, they play a role, but they are diet and nutritional factors. They are environmental factors and many others. So it has been interesting to understand and study the interactions, but this is when, I guess, genomics, if you want to say, came along the story. And the discovery on PAMP3 showed that it's a gene slash SNP that correlates with the disease severity as well as like the fibrosis, the inflammation, and and the hepatocellular carcinoma in these patients. And there were other SNPs that have been discovered along the way, some of which is TM6SF2, as well as the MBO87. Importantly also that there's the HSD17 story that was published in the New England Journal and followed with other articles that is kind of protective gene slash SNP. So what is exciting nowadays, as you know, Patrick, there are companies already trying to, or they are already digging deep into these SNPs and genes, and they have therapies that they they target them, hoping that it will help the disease overall. How do you use genetics today clinically? If you have a patient that walks in and and they're maybe younger than you expect, and and they don't have the quite the diet and lifestyle risk factors that you might expect. How, how, when do you order genetic testing? When do you not? How do you think about that? Yeah. So for, if you actually want an, an immediate assessment where genetics are going, what are early stages? We don't have kind of like a standard of care recommendation to check for genetics in, in, in Maslow yet, but we're going to get there, right? So many of us started already collecting this information through either research study or consortiums on trying to understand these patients, the risk factors, why they're more prone to more severe disease. And there's this concept of rapid progressors 
that they jump from each stage of Maslow and MASH to cirrhosis much faster. So we're trying to understand these patients. So in, in my, I, I, I sit here, I'm sitting right now in the Houston Research Institute that I direct, which also connected to Houston Liver Institute. And we have multiple clinical trials that they go from phase one to phase three, and also have translational studies. And a big part of what we do is collecting this genetic information. It's not just because also we want to understand these patients and the risk factors and development, but also we do clinical trials with many sponsors that they target these SNPs and genes. And we want to have a kind of portfolio or genomo, genomic portfolio. Is that, did I, I make like that? that. Yeah. You, you just made up a word. I think that's going to stick. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, we can target the SNPs and genes in these patients and restratify them correctly and make sure they're getting the right treatment. It will be precision medicine, right? In many of these patients, but they may benefit greatly compared to the other patients and maybe more than any other drug if they have the right genetic soup in, in, in them. So it's exciting. What do you think about the the magical drug resmeteron that's likely to get approved and some of the others that are late? Most of the time what we'll see in a, in a disease like this that is not monogenic and where, where you're very clearly targeting genetic carriers, most people go for a broad population, but then over time, the population will get further stratified based on genetics and other factors. And, and I'm wondering if there's been any work that's been done to look at differences in either efficacy or safety in resmeteron factored on genetics or, or other biomarkers. What might we be able to learn from the recent NEJM article about potential for precision medicine here? Yeah, I mean, we need to start somewhere, right? So we need to address its unmet need. We need to get there in a reasonable time to try to help patients. And the New England Journal paper are targeted toward patients with metabolic risk factors, which was one of the inclusion criteria, which enriched them to be at a higher stage and higher risk population. There are data on their other things in them, such as lipid panel, which improved, and they look at other metabolic parameters. There is ongoing work to look at different things, such as the response to non-invasive tests, so we don't use the biopsy all along, and eventually I'm very sure they will move toward defining the responders versus the non-responders. And I think genomic will be part of that and will be interesting to, to study. I think we need more work in terms of genetics in Maslow and MASH and response to therapy in general. And some sponsors, because of they have MOAs, mechanism of actions that target these SNPs, are more likely to do these studies than others. There have been some studies that connected diet response to pineal P3 and others. So that is interesting. But in, in general, like we need more studies to go there. And I, uh, we did this back in the days, right, with hepatitis C. Hepatitis C, and I, I don't want to compare apples to oranges. Hepatitis C is a different field and it's virology. But I guess hepatologists dig deep then on the genotypes and the identified response based on the genotype. So we wonder if there is a similar story in Maslow and MASH, and not to be naive, it's way more complex because there are other factors in, metabol in metabolic disease, such as environmental and others, as I mentioned earlier. How do you think about, they're not oncoming now, they're all around us, the GLP-1s and the oncoming triple agonists and, and improved, you know, we, we'll know them commonly as the these miracle weight loss drugs, um, but they obviously have some implication on liver health, although it's they're two separate things. And I uh, we were at the same, actually, I don't know if you're able to make it this past year to the Nashtag conference, but there was a lot of discussion about the integration between the GLP-1s, the upcoming liver drugs, we may not know until both of them hit the real world, but I'm curious on how this changes things for you, if at all, in terms of both your daily practice clinically, but also how you think about your research interests with these things absolutely storming in, for better or for worse. A great time to ask about that, Patrick, right? And I'll, I'll tell you why, especially in the last couple of weeks. I think that these are great drugs, and they have the potential to address the problem holistically. If they address the liver, they address the weight, which is quite important, they address type 2 diabetes, and there are data trickling that they have benefit on cardiovascular outcomes, which is one of the major drivers of death in Maslow and MASH patients, as well as there are also announcements about kidney improvement. 
So really? this is, yeah, th th those are exciting data. On the other hand, I just mentioned to you earlier that as a hepatologist and gastroenterologist, we really want to make sure these patients don't slide to cirrhosis because this is when problems hit the fan, as they say. And this is when our patients are more likely to have problems and die. So fibrosis is one of the central things we'll look at, especially in the F3s, which is the stage prior to cirrhosis. I used to hear that GLP-1s or duals doesn't matter. They're going to come just wipe out NASH by wiping out obesity and others, which I would love to happen, but this did not happen. In the semaglutide data published in the New England Journal, they did not meet the primary or the secondary, primary, secondary endpoint of improving fibrosis. Now we can debate that, and they, they have a phase three study are ongoing, so we'll see what's the results. But also, I don't know if you noticed the announcement by Lilly in the last couple of weeks, when they hit natural resolution in a quite high bar, almost 70 plus percent. But if you read the announcement, they said there's a clinically significant fibrosis improvement, but they it doesn't sound like they had the fibrosis improvement statistically, right. which makes you think that the liver has been a humbling experience for this GLP-1s and the duals. And if they are not reversing fibrosis, it makes me think they still have a big role, but they're a window and room for many other drugs to hit the most striking prognostic factor in this disease. There's also the story of, of the duration correctly. There's a story of the GLP-1 and duals act differently, even within the duals, which kind of duals we have and the ratio of each component, those are very important. So the, I would not be surprised if you have certain duals hitting fibrosis improvement versus other not hitting. And that will be interesting thing to watch over time. Yeah, very interesting. I, I was also curious how you think about early intervention versus late intervention. Obviously, we, uh, we all want to go earlier, but there are some very practical challenges, including how you operationalize the, the number of people you're talking about if you're doing early screening and detection and prevention is order of magnitudes more than the people that are cirrhotic, for example. So it's a different problem to solve. It's it's just fundamentally hundreds of millions instead of you know millions or or tens of millions. How how do you think about the different problems that we need to solve to live in a world where almost no one gets to yeah, liver transplant or late stage cirrhosis, and instead we catch everything upstream, whether it's diet and lifestyle changes combined with genetics, combined with you know prescription of GLP ones or other things, much earlier than we're doing it currently. Yeah, and and Patrick, like I think everyone should think. First, naturally and holistically, we don't want to put the entire West country in, on drugs, right? Although weight loss has been really challenging, and I, I don't want to get philosophical here and talk about the diet and change the components of the food. You the can food if you want, by the way. This is a philosophy I, I would, cast as well I, as a genetics I, I, one. I think we should, we, we should start there at a certain point as well. Yeah. It's not like just go after the drugs. Go after the fast food the bad food, what, what, what's going on the label, the portion size, how to tax that. There are some countries that they started taxing alcohol at a higher rate and the alcohol problem dropped. I think there's also a country in South America started now taxing more on the fast food and all this. I don't want to cause anyone to bankrupt, but also we're hurting people by just in introducing this bad diet around the world. So that's a whole conversation by itself. But the cost-effective analysis in the Mazel and MASH field that the, the, to treat the liver problem, you have to hit fibrosis. But you're right on. Why not start early? Weight loss and exercise, diet, changing the food. And if they cannot lose the weight, maybe introduce pharmacological agents for earlier stages because they have, it's not indicated yet for them, but they have the obesity and type 2 diabetes. So hopefully you can stop it there and not them progressing. And now if you look at the American Gastroenterology Association recommendation or the ASLD recommendation, they also hint that if you have metabolic syndrome or obesity, you can start earlier treating those, which eventually will treat MASH. But for drugs for MASH or at-risk MASH, where 
developing specific drugs that will help the fibrosis in these patients. That makes sense. And and this is something that I hadn't fully appreciated until recently, but there is a I, I think a pretty clear gene by environment interaction with PMPLA3, for example, and some of the other genetic risk factors where the negative impacts on the liver are revealed by environmental factors, diet and exercise factors that uh, you know, wouldn't show up in the absence of that environment. So it's a, it's a really important point as well that in some diseases, genetics are destiny. When you in, It's fully penetrant, you inherit the gene and you get the disease. This is a very different case where actually there's a quite a complex feedback loop between genes, environment, lifestyle. And it's it's not at all the case that if you have the gene, you're going to go ahead and get the disease. And so there's something I think important in there, just thinking right. from an individual perspective that maybe there's a message that will be helpful for some people to hear that actually you have inherited genes that mean this lifestyle is particularly damaging to your liver. And that could be a good reason for a lot of people to make that lifestyle change, right? That having that new piece of information may not help everybody, but may actually help some people to realize that, hey, I've been dealt I've been dealt a different deck and everybody, we all have. We all have things that run in our families because we've been, been dealt a slightly different deck. Do you think about it that way or do you think about it differently? Yeah, and, and let me give you an example, Patrick. It's like if I have an F1 patient and I genostratify them by PDLP3 and say, hey, you are actually at increased risk compared to the other F1 patient that I saw earlier and yeah. you might progress faster and you're more likely to get cirrhosis and all this more drastic interventions and more careful observation and follow-up should be followed in these patients to avoid. We have a lot of patients that nothing happens to them. On the other hand, there's like there are patients like, oh my God, I have cirrhosis. I'm I'm 45 years old. I, I see that a lot in Texas. So there's a story there, and we need to stop this increasing epidemic of metabolic syndrome and mass cirrhosis. Yeah, and I, one of the reasons I like this podcast is because I can have this kind of conversation across some really different therapy areas. So on a very recent episode, I interviewed Michael Benatar, who's a he's based in Miami, and he does research into AL. A neurodegenerative disease and, and genetic forms of it. And he's been working for 10 years looking at people who are carriers of genetic risk factors for ALS, some of whom go on to develop the disease, others don't, but trying to pick up those. You know, genetics is a, is a blunt instrument and it tells you your lifetime risk at, at best, right? Uh, but it doesn't tell you, are you tipping into being symptomatic this year or this month in most cases? And so having that information in, you know, it's, it's a very different disease, obviously, that we're working with here, but there are a lot of parallels between how you can think about, and, and they've just had a drug approved in SOD1 ALS, and now they're running a large scale trial in gene carriers to look at preventing the disease in the first place, rather than waiting until someone comes symptomatic. So there's a lot of really interesting parallels, obviously, with the breast cancer world as well, where there probably may be more parallels here of how genetic testing can influence care decisions and, and all sorts of things for people. But I'm excited that we're going to hopefully have an approved drug soon because that is going to change a lot of things, hopefully for the better, right? And and should influence more investment into the space. And let me comment on that. It's I don't want to make it more complicated, but many of us starting moving, especially if you do clinical trials. So here, like I have expertise in, in Mazel and MASH, but also to help our patients, we move down the road or the same direction of many other things that are related to genetic genetics and metabolic treatments. So I'll give you an example. Like here, we, we started doing clinical trials on obesity. And many of our patients that get excluded for Mazel and MASH, they still have a disease and they can benefit from other drugs and obesity. But also to your point, talking about CNS, yeah. we started having interest in Alzheimer's disease and I have like some family history of that. So it caught my interest, at least from the metabolic standpoint right now, because as you know, some drugs, metabolic drugs started targeting Alzheimer's disease as well. And we're looking into the connection between Alzheimer and metabolic feature, as well as fatty liver. And if there's metabolic and shared genetic features in these patients and in research institutes such as the one I, I'm in right now, we are even extending our clinical trials into Alzheimer's disease and those that they are, we think they are interconnected metabolically or genomically or other ways. Yes, I, I think probably both, right? Because there is obviously the metabolic risk factor, but I, I was reading some recent genetics work that uh, APOE 
the gene that's involved in Alzheimer's risk is is also potentially protective against non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, right? So there's a lot of stories still to be told there. And it's it's great that you're getting into that space because I think we need more of these thinking more holistically. I'll be, we talked about holistically from the sense of diet and exercise, but also medicine, right? If we're too focused on our particular organ or a particular area of medicine, you miss some of these bigger pictures, right? Indeed, indeed. Just to to wrap up here, what are the next big things you're thinking about? We've talked a lot about what's changed the past, you know, some of the big learnings that you've had over your career. What are the couple things that you're most excited about right now that you're working on that you could talk about? Yeah, I have a project right now. We touched base on earlier that the non-invasive test placing liver biopsy, and we have a large prospective study that we're starting in, in my institute with help with many colleagues and friends in the field where we're going to collect the needed evidence for non-invasive testing to replace a liver biopsy in a project called Neil NIT. There will be also genetic information in that, metabolomics, proteomics, and many others to try to get it. I've also, in some of the blood tests that I mentioned, we published a paper on a test called Massive Score, which is metabolomic test to test for at risk NASH. So I was pleased to see this recently in the market. It's called the OWL test and, and cover the multi-spectrum of the disease, but our paper was published on the at-risk mesh. So this test now covered the entire spectrum, and I would love to see also outcome data on that. So that's exciting in, in the NIT's field. I continue to be involved daily. I I was just on a call earlier with one of the sponsors designing a protocol. We talked about also submission of their paper, one of the papers to the New England Journal. So it keeps me going every day, designing these studies and helping our patients in a disease that has no treatment as of February 2024, when when we're talking right now. I also like enjoy mentoring people. So I'm hoping to bring more young people into this field. I'm still young too, but younger than me. And bring them to this field and let them grow with us in this field. Wonderful. A question I should have asked earlier that is actually on the topic of mentorship. What was it like to be taught? By your dad was it did it strengthen your relationship did it pull you apart or was how how was that man that's i did not get that question before my my dad is he has the best heart ever but he's a tough guy so those are the uh, best people though yeah he's yeah. now 81 unfortunately he suffers from metabolic syndrome and many complications and some and organ damage so it has been humbling seeing him going through this it has been motivating to continue doing this he does not have mazel or, or or cirrhosis but until today and I, I i i'm very pleased and blessed in what i have done thus far but until today i feel like i have to show him that i'm i'm doing better so yeah it's he's a role model so it's been great to be under his mentorship I think it's amazing. I won't put words in his mouth, but I would suspect that he's very proud of you. So thank you. I really appreciate you doing this. This was an awesome conversation and I learned a lot. Thank you so much, Patrick. It was a privilege to be here and keep up go- doing the good work with this program is is very exciting. And I think it spreads knowledge and awareness. So it is to you. Thank you so much. We couldn't do it without great guests like you and without our great listeners. So thanks everybody, as always, for tuning in. The thing that I really appreciate if you like this episode is just share it with a friend or colleague, somebody that you think would enjoy it. And also, of course, you can leave us a review on your favorite podcast player. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next time.